Good evening and welcome to the third lecture in our public lecture series for Contagion, the exhibition season that we launched on Friday evening, last Friday evening. We are Science Gallery Bengaluru, a government of Karnataka supported and funded institution for research-based public engagement. We're also part of an international network of galleries located at eight universities across the world. Contagion is our first fully online exhibition season and what a time to be holding it. We are living in an incredibly difficult moment and we hope that through the knowledge and the understanding that the many scholars that we are bringing to the series, um, to the lecture series will help many of us make sense of what is going on around us. This lecture series is supported by the Indian National Academy of Science. And today it is my pleasure to welcome Sylvie Briand, who will be talking about contemporary face of epidemics and pandemics dealing with the infodemic. Dr. Sylvie Briand is the director of the Global Infectious Hazard Preparedness at the World Health Organization in Geneva. The Department of Global Infectious Hazard Preparedness, or GIH, advances global efforts to prevent and control existing and emerging infectious diseases by increasing access to evidence-based interventions. And I'm delighted to know that Professor Brian uh, will be speaking about one such intervention today, and by leveraging technical, operational, and strategic partnerships globally. Since 2001, Dr. Briant has been actively involved in the detection, preparedness, and response to global threats, leading the scientific and strategic component of the WHO response to COVID-19, avian and pandemic influenza, Ebola, Zika, plague, yellow fever, cholera, and MERS, among others. Before joining the WHO, Dr. Briant worked as a public health project director for different global health agencies in different geographic region, regions, including South America, and Africa. Dr. Brian, it's a pleasure to welcome you this evening and over to you. Good evening, everyone, and, and really many thanks for inviting me. I'm very honored to be here today and very pleased also to be able to share uh, some of the work we do at the WHO about uh, infodemic management. Before starting, I would like to dedicate this lecture to the millions of people who are have suffered or are suffering from COVID-19 and for to their families who are going through very difficult times as well. Last year in March 2020, I my husband had COVID-19 and my son as well. So I know what it means uh, to be facing this disease. And so that's why I really wish everyone a safe and prompt recovery. So I will share my screen. I have a few slides and that will help us to go through this subject. So I will talk about the, a very contemporary feature of epidemics and pandemic, which is the infodemic. And you will know what it is very soon. So on this slide, you see that since the beginning of this century, we have had many large epidemics or even pandemics, and uh, this trend is increasing. We had cholera, H5N1, SARS in 2003, H1N1 in 2009, MERS in 2012, Ebola 2014, Zika 2015, yellow fever in Central Africa and Brazil 2016, uh, plague in Madagascar in 2017, and now we are also facing COVID-19 uh, that started uh, in 19, but uh, we still are facing this disease. So why do we have so many large outbreaks? Uh, because we are more people on Earth, and also we travel more. We, we are more mobile. And so these uh, give a, a lot of opportunity for pathogen to spread, and this is why we have more epidemics. Before we had a localized outbreak uh, that were staying localized, but now we have large epidemics that can spread very rapidly across the world. So 
what is important to understand as well is that this increase of epidemic is not only due to uh, population density and mobility, but also the fact that we have different relationship with nature and with animals. And 75% of emerging pathogens are from animal origin. And this is the case also with COVID-19, which as you know, uh, probably uh, originated from bats uh, in the southern part of China and then uh, contaminated humans through potentially an intermediate host, but we have still not found this intermediate host, and then it spread to the entire world. So what is the infodemic? So infodemic is a tsunami of information, some accurate, some not, that spreads along a disease epidemic. And here on this uh, slide, you have the epidemic curve, which sometimes is um, uh, decreased thanks to health intervention. Um, and the infodemic is accompanying every epidemic. And I said every epidemic because in my career, I've not seen any outbreak or epidemic not accompanied by the infodemic. You have um, infodemic during Ebola outbreak, uh, during uh, the H1N1 pandemic, during yellow fever, during plague. Uh, it's different kind of, of um, uh, infodemic, of course, because uh, depending where, where, it or what it, where it is, but still uh, every outbreak has uh, infodemic. And uh, some of the information um, are not accurate, like and what we call them rumors. And, and it's very important to understand uh, this phenomenon of infodemic that includes rumors because it may hamper your uh, response to the epidemic. To give you an example, for instance, uh, in 2016, when uh, we were uh, responding to the outbreak of um, yellow fever in Angola, uh, it was very important that people got vaccinated quickly because the vaccine is very safe and also it protects very well against the disease. Um, but there was a rumor circulating in the city that uh, if you get vaccinated, uh, then you cannot drink beer for one week. And so many people didn't want to get vaccinated because they preferred to uh, drink beer. And uh, they were worried that uh, the vaccine would make them sick. So these are the kind of rumors that uh, can hamper really a vaccination campaign. And this is what happened actually in, in, uh, in Angola. Uh, but fortunately, with uh, good risk communication, we managed to change this and um, increase the vaccine uptake at that time. So two characteristics of epidemics and pandemics, it's fear and uncertainty. And this is why also there have been many, many movies on pandemic and, and epidemics, because uh, it really triggers very profound emotions in human beings. And uh, beyond the health um, impact, it has also a, an enormous impact on our mental health, but also on our communities. And as you see here in the um, uh, poster of, of Contagion, um, a movie that uh, was um, uh, presented a few years ago, uh, it was it said, nothing spreads like fear. And it's true, and you see this with this COVID-19 pandemic, fear is definitively an important characteristic of this pandemic. So if you manage well infodemic, you can also manage well or manage better uh, the fear and the uncertainty. But if you don't manage well uh, infodemic, fear and uncertainty can increase and have bad consequences. Also, what is very important to understand is that during crisis, um, people are much more sensitive to rumors and misinformation. Uh, and so we need also to take this into account in our activities because people and we all are more sensitive to misinformation and disinformation, especially during crisis uh, time. So what is the issue with the current uh, COVID-19 uh, um, infodemic? As our director general, Dr. Tedros, said, we are not just fighting an epidemic, we are fighting an infodemic. And he said this last year on 15 February, 2020. And why did he say that? Because we already saw at that time that there was an overabundance of information 
that make it difficult for people to make decisions for their health. And we expect during a pandemic or an epidemic that people knowing about the risks, they will change their behavior, not forever necessarily, but just for the time of the crisis so that they can better protect their health and the health of their families. Also, it's very important to differentiate what is misinformation. Misinformation is a false information, but the person spreading them have no intent to harm anybody, while disinformation Usually it's an in bad information as well, but it's with an intent to harm uh, the others. And so um, in any case, both myths and disinformation cause harm, uh, but probably the solution to misinformation and disinformation are different because of the intent. So during COVID-19, the infodemic really had, had produced a lot of harm uh, because uh, you have seen there's so much information out there that you are really confused, you don't know really what to do, what is good for you, what is good for your family. Uh, and some people are taking risks that are not necessary. And sometimes also they are adopting behavior that are harmful. And we saw, for instance, in Iran, at the beginning of this pandemic, where they had really a, a huge increase in number of cases, people were very afraid of getting the disease and dying from it. And so they believe the rumor that methanol was a potential cure for COVID-19. And this was not true. Uh, it's a poison. And 700 people apparently have died just because they believed this rumor and they took uh, this um, uh, methanol. And so um, it's, it's important to be very careful about uh, those, uh, this misinformation because it can really harm your health uh, directly. But there are other impacts of the infodemic, uh, in addition to the direct impact on health and mortality. Uh, the fact is that first, if people misunderstand the health information, they also uh, may adopt behavior that are not the correct one. And they may feel safe, but in reality, they are not so safe because they are not implementing the measure properly. The other uh, consequences of infodemic is also the mistrust. And as you may know, trust is absolutely fundamental for any outbreak, epidemic, and pandemic response. Without trust, you cannot deal with this, such a crisis. So when you have mistrust, it's, it's very bad because then everything becomes more complicated, more difficult to deal with, and indirectly, it can also have an even worse impact on, on health. And this mistrust because of the infodemic uh, is mistrust against the government, uh, mistrust in science, mistrust in expertise, uh, mistrust in public health authorities and the intervention they recommend, like vaccine, therapeutics, diagnostics, and so on. The impact of the infodemic as well is the stigma. It has increased stigma in many countries. Um, for instance, um, in some countries, you know, uh, we were saying um, uh, elderly are more at risk to die and uh, young people are more at risk to transmit the virus. And so there was a kind of a, a, a bridge, a, a gap, sorry, between generations because uh, uh, then uh, elderly were accusing youth to uh, be the ones uh, fueling the, the increase in number of cases. And, and the youth were accusing the elderly uh, of uh, really uh, damaging their um, uh, life and, 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 um, and having so much impact on, on economies and, and societies but because of the lockdown measures. So the stigmatization has occurred in many places and there are many different types of, of um, claim, but uh, it's, it's a real phenomenon as well. And finally, uh, uh, this infodemic can undermine social cohesiveness, and you have seen in many countries the politicization of the crisis and really a different group confronting themselves and not being able to fight the disease together, but really they were fighting between each other. So what is really concerning with the infodemic is because the technology has changed a lot of things in our life, but in particular, the way information is produced, distributed, and consumed. You see on this picture how we were getting information in the 1916, and how we are now getting it in 2016. 
uh, it's completely different. And we have access to much more information than we had uh, in previous uh, uh, centuries and generation. And so um, the infodemic has increased in, in, in quantity, intensity, uh, but also uh, the, the velocity or the speed uh, of spread of, of uh, rumors, uh, misinformation and disinformation. And so um, by this slide, I just want you to understand that you are also contributing to the infodemic. I am also contributing to the infodemic. And so managing infodemic, it's not only uh, a problem for governments or for health institutions. Everybody has a role to play in managing infodemic. And we will see how we can do it. So at individual level, really, we can uh, uh, be more careful in the way we spread information. And you see uh, here uh, on this graph chain of transmissions. And of course, it's the same with the virus. I mean, you can transmit or not transmit the virus, uh, but uh, it depends how you behave. And here you see that it starts with this um, a person who uh, uh, send some information, and then it goes to two people, and from two people, then it goes to uh, more people, and so on and so forth. And at the end, it can really reach a huge number of person. But uh, here you have somebody who double checked the fact and verified this information and decided not to spread it further because uh, thinking it's not accurate. Um, this in person didn't spread it further either because got other information from trusted sources and decided to spread another type of information. And this person didn't spread it either because they thought, okay, how do you know that's true? And, and before uh, uh, sharing the, the video or the information, really checking if it's true and, and how and analyze and be critical about uh, this information. So it's very important that everybody plays a role in this by breaking this chain of transmission, but also understanding how this phenomenon can amplify and really um, um, contaminate a large portion of the population if uh, people are not cautious about it. But we can do things at individual level, but it's also important to do things at an other level. And this is what we do at WHO. Uh, we really work across uh, uh, different countries and, and governments and, and institutions to try to manage better this phenomenon that affects all of us by first trying to find measures uh, of this phenomenon and, and, and understanding if it's increasing, decreasing, uh, what is going on, and to be able to monitor it as well. Uh, because when it becomes unmanageable or uncontrollable, it's, it's really time to do something uh, very strong about it. Then it's very important also to detect when you start to see misinformation spreading and understand why it is spreading, uh, because this will help you also to define the intervention you can do about it. So here you see we, we de are developing uh, intervention to protect and mitigate uh, about the infodemic and its harmful effects, sorry. And finally, we also try to um, evaluate our, our intervention and see if they are effective or not and strengthen the resilience of individuals and communities to the infodemic, especially during uh, epidemics, because as I said before, people are more vulnerable uh, during epidemic uh, to the infodemic. So there are four things that we do um, uh, to manage infodemic. We first listen to concern. Second, we translate science and communicate risk. Third, we promote resilience to misinformation. And fourth, we engage and empower communities. And I will go through this fourth item one by one to give you example and uh, more information on each of them. So the first one is really listening to concern. Uh, we have developed tools to listen to people, uh, the conversation online. Uh, it's anonymous, of course, but it helps really to understand what are the concerns of people. And listening doesn't just mean hearing. It means listening with no preconception, really trying to understand why people are asking those questions, 
uh, if they are fearful or not, uh, how can we really best answer to their question and needs for information? And so I will uh, give now the floor to Avishal, who is working uh, in our team, and he will uh, introduce a tool that has been developed by WHO and partners to uh, perform this uh, social listening online. Avishal, you have the floor. Yeah, I'll just uh, share my screen, so. Yes. Uh, yeah, okay, one minute. Uh, uh, okay, I hope everyone can see the uh, screen. So just a bit of a background. So this is the EARS public platform. Anyone can use it. Uh, I'm gonna pop up the link in the chat later so you can explore it on your own. So EARS platform shows real-time information uh, on how people are talking about COVID-19 online. This information is intended to serve public health professionals to understand narratives and needs of general public. A little bit about the technology of the EARS platform. So what we do is that EARS uses a natural language processing and machine learning algorithm to structure millions of opinions from Twitter post, public Twitter post, public uh, Reddit uh, comments, public YouTube comments. And now we're in the process of uh, integrating Facebook data as well. So it structures all these opinions uh, into five categories. So these are all the five categories. And this is the public health taxonomy developed by WHO and uh, partner health institutes. Uh, over here is the 39 subcategories or topics of conversations, which are each subcategory being part of this uh, 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 major category. And this is where these are the topic of conversations people are having online. And one thing we can do is sort it by looking at the volume of the conversations, the sheer number of conversations taking place in any of these particular topics. Uh, but another way to look at this is to look at uh, sorted by rising. So what rising does is allows you to see what is going to be the next uh, narrative, next big challenge. And you can, you can, you're not blindsided by it. So to use a cricket uh, metaphor that you're not on the back foot when that happens. Um, then uh, here you can use, uh, you can choose one of our 20 pilot countries and look at these topics of conversations and see the trends that are happening in it. So you can filter all, uh, you can filter all this information by categories, by seven days or 30 days, but also you can look at the intent behind these opinions. So whether there are questions and complaints to get a better understanding of what's uh, going on in the conversation. So here's a simple uh, heat map. So what uh, on the upper X axis, you see all the 39 subcategories, topics of conversations. And on the Y axis, we have our 20 pilot countries. Uh, we can also uh, filter this information based on regions we are interested in. Uh, you might want to compare across different countries. And just to clarify, this is all normalized information. So we can make comparison across countries. Uh, innovative feature we've added to years is the gender gap. So what gender gap does is it looks at this information based on the uh, prism of gender. So if there is certain uh, type of conversations that are driven by females, you can look at it. And then certain kind of information which is driven by male, you can, males, you can look at it. So this is a brief introduction of the EARS public platform. I'm gonna pop the link as I mentioned, and please do uh, check it out. But a big powerful component of EARS is the backend. So backend is where a lot of uh, disaggregated raw feed of information is given, and it aggregates to give this macro level trends you see on the public platform. Uh, I'll just show you a bit about the backend. So first thing to notice is that it's, uh, it's authorized user only. I'm gonna put my username and password and then log in into it. Uh, here in the backend, you can look at, uh, you can filter information for any time period. You can look at any country. Uh, you can choose data sources. So whether it's public Twitter post or public web content or even Facebook as well. But not just that, you can search for particular terms. So if there are words or if there are, uh, certain things happening. You can search for those terms and look at what the conversation around those terms are. Before I go uh, forward, I'm gonna show you another tool, benchmark analysis. So benchmark analysis is another macro level tool available in the backend. And what it shows is that within one of these 39 categories or topics of conversations, which within uh, across country, which is the outlier. So in, in a particular country, where are people talking more about? And it, it is a basically a horizon scanning tool. So uh, you can just look, start from it and then just deep uh, dive deeply into what is going on here. Um, going back to the analysis of so these are all our 20 pilot countries. 
and these are 39 subcategories. So it's sometimes difficult to uh, view all these 39 categories to so provide a spider web analysis. You can easily take care and see which are the categories uh, which are popping up and then you can go and just explore those categories. Once I go into explore, I, uh, we, we, we see something like this. So this is a country specific page. You can check out the sentiment analysis on what are the sentiments of the general public on each of these subcategories. But here is what is uh, important thing is the alert feed. So what alert does is that if there's a spike of conversation in a particular uh, topic of conversation, it, may, it, it alerts you. And then you can have daily or weekly alerts that there's something going on and probably worth checking into. So we can also then investigate why it's happening and it takes us here. And it's just a, a example from COVID-19 vaccine category. There are questions from people. What is general public thinking about? You can look at these tweets. You can also look at the important keywords. So what are the keywords public health specialists need to engage around? And if there are information voids, you can then through your communication channel, fill these information while you can provide information to the public that no, this is not true. Or if there are questions, you can provide these ans uh, provide answers to it. So this is a small overview of what uh, the public and the back end uh, of ears looks like. Uh, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed it. Over to you. Yes, thank you very much, Avishal. I mean, great great um, overview of, of this tool and um, and um, why WHO developed this because we we thought it was really um, uh, important not only to um, listen to people and listen to their concern uh, but also provide to decision makers uh, similar tools so that they can better understand their population uh, and of course, we have developed many other tools, but this one is really uh, attractive because it, it gives uh, uh, in, a, in a real time uh, to decision maker not only uh, the topics that people are discussing or the concern people have at a given time, but also their sentiment about this, if it's anger or fear or compliance. And so uh, if they have, if the population is very fearful, then it's very important to uh, give messages to reassure people and, and to really um, uh, provide them with information that will enable them to be less fearful or less uh, anxious. And so these are the kind of things that uh, will help probably uh, decision makers to manage better the infodemic uh, now and in the future. So the second topic that is also very important to manage infodemic is, is translating science and communicating risk appropriately. Uh, we have uh, experienced in previous outbreaks and pandemics and epidemics that uh, it's impossible to eliminate the infodemic. You can just manage it. So uh, this is why the management is so important and, and for which you need tools. And you see on the picture that uh, we have tools to manage epidemic, which are vaccine, therapeutic, uh, um, uh, public health measures. And also we are developing a toolbox to manage uh, infodemic. But this toolbox, uh, like for uh, the epidemic, um, it has to be backed up by science. It has to rely on evidence-based information and it should use uh, the best practices, including sharing of experience and, and continuous learning. So it's a big journey, but uh, uh, we try really to do it uh, the best way we can. And it's really important because if people get the right information at the right time and in the right format, they may rapidly adopt behavior that will protect their health and the health of the others. So critical. Another thing that is really important is to translate the science. As you have seen since the beginning of this pandemic, there have been thousands of publications, scientific publications, and it's not very easy to um, uh, know who is right, who is wrong, and probably nobody, just uh, science is in progress. And what we try is to uh, capture uh, those advances in science through a slide set, and you can find them on our website. We try to have a, a weekly uh, slide set on, certain, on a, a given topic. And this slide set translates the science that we know what we know currently about the subject and uh, where you can find uh, the scientific publication uh, that are backing up uh, this uh, uh, um, assessment or, or these uh, slide sets. 
We also develop some visuals to help people to um, uh, behave during a COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, of course, these are very generic. And then uh, we work with our regional offices and country offices to adapt them, not only the translation, uh, the language, but also adapt them to the, the way of life of people and to their habits uh, so that they can uh, adopt those behavior more easily. We have also issued a, a number of um, uh, videos as well on how to wear masks, how to fabric a mask, uh, how to protect yourself, uh, uh, how to break chains of transmission and so on and so forth. So you can also look at our website if you are interested. The third item that is really important to uh, manage infodemic, it's promoting resilience to misinformation. And here, uh, I, of course, the best way to uh, promote resilience to misinformation is really to increase health literacy. I mean, people need to know a little bit about what is a virus, uh, what is the treatment, what is a vaccine, how does it work, so that they can really understand why we are using those interventions to combat COVID-19. Unfortunately, uh, we see that there are lots of inequities in health in the world. And uh, most of the time, uh, there is also inequities in health literacy, and there are the same inequities. And you see those two pictures. It was in 2003. Uh, we had at the same time SARS uh, in Asia, and uh, we had a cholera, a really deadly cholera epidemic in, 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 in Africa. And you see that the condition uh, for health were really different at that time. And unfortunately, we still see nowadays those inequity in health. So, it's very important when we uh, develop strategies to resist or, or make people more resilient to misinformation to take those inequities into account. Also, what we see is that infodemic management is done online, and Avishal presented this very interesting tool, but most of the population of the world, I mean, at least 56% of the world population doesn't have access to um, the, the online or regular access to internet. So, uh, for those people, we need to define other approaches and other type of strategy. But for um, managing, I mean, or, or increasing the resilience to uh, misinformation, uh, we have developed some tips. So the first thing you need to do is first assess the source, who is producing this information, where this, does it come from, uh, and uh, can you check if the source is reliable? Then you need to go beyond the headlines. Sometimes you see a very attractive uh, media uh, article, but uh, when you read the article, sometimes the content is very different from the headline. You need to identify the author. Is it somebody you can trust, or is it somebody uh, who has just uh, an opinion on the subject, but is not really an expert on, on this issue? You need to check the date as well, because we have seen that now we are one year and a half into the pandemic and, and some clips or videos that were issued at the beginning of the pandemic are circulating again, so check the date. You need to examine, examine the supporting evidence uh, and if possible, uh, go and, and, and try to read uh, the articles or the, the sources that are mentioned uh, in, uh, in, the, um, in the statement uh, you, you are reading. You need also to check your own bias. Uh, sometimes we really want things to get better. So we will be tempted to listen more to people who are saying, oh, this COVID-19 is nothing, don't worry. Um, and so we need to check really uh, what are, are our bias before really interpreting an information. And, uh, and sometimes you can also uh, look at fact checkers. There are people now that uh, their profession is to fact check and they are uh, doing this uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, they know what is circulating and, and they can also help uh, to debunk myths uh, when, when we see some of them. What we have done as well is working with communities, uh, especially uh, faith-based communities, youth and employers and workers uh, to develop with them to co-develop guidance to how to uh, uh, deal with COVID-19. And so uh, these collaborations have been extremely uh, fruitful uh, because it helps not only to adapt the messages to the community uh, that is the target, 
but also to um, uh, make sure that those messages or intervention or recommendation are uh, easier to put in place in a, in a given context. And it facilitates a, a dialogue also. Uh, and uh, we have used uh, the new technologies like uh, uh, the Zoom platform and, and other platforms to uh, really continue to discuss and to adapt as we go the measures and the recommendation to a given community. So we had done, uh, and you can find them also on our website, uh, 80 COVID-19 related webinars with uh, participants from 149 countries since the beginning of this pandemic. So the example of faith-based community, for instance, at the beginning of this pandemic, we observed that there was a number of um, amplifying events uh, due to a religious gathering. Uh, whether it was in Italy, in, uh, in, um, in Korea, or in Iran at the beginning. And so we develop a guidance with faith-based organization to uh, ensure that they can continue to have their um, um, religious event, but in a safer manner. And we adapted uh, the, the recommendation depending on the religion, whether it's Catholic or, or um, Muslim or Buddhist or whatever religion. With youth, we also develop um, a design lab. Uh, we work with a youth association to develop contents that were adapted to the young, younger generation. And uh, they have designed uh, a creative and, and, and relevant uh, communication content around the uh, reducing transmission of COVID-19. We also work with communities that have no access to internet or are in remote places with our colleagues and partners from UNICEF, uh, IFRC, and also uh, NGOs uh, in the fields. And uh, you can have a look at the uh, risk communication and community engagement collective service. Uh, they, those partners have developed a website and a knowledge hub where you can find information, uh, but also uh, tips and, and, and guidances if, if you need them. My last slides are about uh, two important um, announcements I want to make. The first is that we have started to train people uh, to be uh, infodemic manager uh, in the 21st century. Uh, because even if this phenomenon infodemic is not new, uh, we see it all, all uh, over the time. Uh, still, it has certain characteristics because of uh, the increase of, of social media and, and uh, virtual conversation. Uh, it, it's slightly different from what we faced, uh, uh, for instance, 30 years ago in, in, uh, in the 20th century. So uh, this is why we have developed this new uh, curriculum. And you will see at the end, I, you can also enroll if you are interested. The other announcement I want to uh, highlight is really the, the fact that we have uh, uh, created a, a new scientific discipline called infodemiology, like epidemiology, uh, but it's for infodemic management. And uh, because as I said earlier, we want to uh, have an evidence-based approach and we need therefore to generate the evidence of what is uh, um, the infodemic and what is the impact of the infodemic. So uh, we brought together scientists from all over the world, uh, but from and also from very different scientific disciplines from mathematics, chemistry, physics, epidemiology, uh, anthropologists, sociologists, psychologists, uh, data scientists, uh, and so on, to really uh, look at this phenomenon of infodemic and see um, and answer a few questions. So we have now a, a research agenda for the coming years, and we hope that we will make a lot of progress in better understanding infodemic. So the question we wanted to answer are, how do overwhelming amounts of information affect behavior in emergencies, and what interventions are affected in addressing it? How does online behavior affect offline behavior? How does infodemic affect cognition and influence seeking of health services? How does the role of policy intervention successfully address and mitigate health misinformation? And how does the infodemic affect closed network and vulnerable population? And so you can have a look at this research agenda, it's online as well. And I will try now to um, 
show you a short video to finish this lecture. I hope it will work. Yes. Sorry, we can't see the video. Sorry? We can't see the video. Might it help to just click on the link, the YouTube link? Sorry, sorry. Can you see it? Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to work. Avichal, are you able to probably put the link in the chat box so that people can okay. actually have a look so at I it? Will, I will stop this. Uh, sorry for that. No problem. No problem. Thank you, Avichal. Yeah, so we have the link. So those of you who... Yes, okay. Yeah. I think it would be better if you have the... I will um, put the link in the chat box after this and, and so that you can have access to, uh, yeah. so uh, now let me, so I had, the, my last slide was just to show uh, all the partners that are working with us and, um, and then just to say thank you. So I will just try to go to this. Um, sorry, I'm a bit, uh, it's a bit bad. So I will, I will uh, do it again. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So this is what just, I wanted to thank all the partners that are working with us and there are many more, but uh, it didn't fit in this slide. And just to say thank you to all of you for your attention. And here you have, um, on our website, you can also sign a petition for um, uh, managing in infodemic. And as I said, uh, many people are, um, uh, I mean, many groups have to something to do with infodemic. So, uh, and we did a call to action in December last year. So to engage with more people, you can apply for the training as well. Uh, you can learn about what we do about uh, infodemic response. And you can also subscribe to our infodemic management news flash where you are informed about the trainings and all the activities that uh, are related to this uh, uh, infodemic management. So with this, I end my slide set and stop sharing. That's it. Thanks a lot. Sorry for the... It's not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cindy. That was a uh, uh, that was a uh, very very interesting uh, lecture because because of two things, right? Uh, in the first place, it is it is in it is important because we found ourselves over a prolonged period of time getting shifting information also from from uh, public health messaging, so even from authority, but also then as people started to find ways of dealing with it themselves or where they felt helpless, they started generating information themselves. And we found ourselves in a, in a position where we were unable to judge the constantly shifting scientific knowledge, the shifting public health messaging and the shifting self-generated messages. Mm -hmm. And to find yourself in a position where you, where you can no longer discern knowledge from information, from opinion, is an extremely difficult place to be, especially when you find yourself also ill or when you find your loved ones ill yeah. and unable to deal with, uh, unable to deal with circumstances. So it is really, um, it is really interesting therefore to have your lecture to see how, how the World Health Organization but also other agencies are coming together to recognize this as a very serious aspect mm -hmm. of epidemiology and of managing a pandemic or, or, a, pa or a global health situation. And that's why this, the second aspect of it is interesting to me also as an academic to see that this is an emerging field that will now call on resources 
the kind of robust research that goes into the making of epidemiology, if it goes into the making of info infodemiology or info information epidemiology, then we will find ourselves increasingly better able to deal with this aspect and also create a sense of better judgment because we will have people trained with it. And, that, and that's why personally, I find it also, also quite reassuring that there is now training available in these areas. So thank you again for this. Uh, uh, for, for, for our audiences, please uh, put your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, I'm sure you have many questions to ask, uh, not only about the WHO initiative, but also uh, various other aspects of information management or infodemic management uh, for Sylvie. So please go ahead and, and put, your, uh, put your questions in there. Um, I will start with a question from uh, Papia Bhattacharya. Uh, who's a journalist whose question is that um, in your observations, in your study, uh, in your research, what is it that you've noticed about the second wave that we see now um, sort of, you know, simply spiraling out of control in India? Um, what do you think was the role of information spread and what kind of information spread patterns have you observed during this wave? Okay, thanks. Um, so I think the... Um, the, the, so there are many aspects to your question uh, about the content. I think uh, what we have seen in, in the second waves in different countries is if, if now we have vaccine, so it changes a little bit the, the type of uh, discussion uh, yeah. because before there was no vaccine. So really the conversation was more on, on the uh, public health and social measures such as mask and, and uh, uh, the precautionary measure that we are uh, advocating for, but now the vaccine is a, a new topic, a hot topic also that is um, uh, discussed and also the access to vaccine. Uh, because as you know, there is a limited uh, production currently on the world. So uh, the type of vaccine you can access as well, the adverse effect of the vaccine. So the conversation uh, are varied over time, but, uh, but of course the vaccine has been really a, an enormous part of the conversation. The second thing that, that we see also with the, uh, the second wave or third wave, depending on the countries, uh, is the, the politicization as mm -hmm. well. Uh, because the first wave, it was a big surprise. So probably people thought, okay, um, let's see. Uh, what is happening. But now uh, people feel that uh, they know more about the disease. So they are really uh, expecting from governments to, to do something about it. And, and probably uh, uh, so governments have also to manage expectation uh, of the people. And these expectations are probably much higher now than they were uh, one year ago. Um, so uh, this is it. And in terms of, um, um, I think in terms of uh, globally, I would say I, I'm not um, a specialist uh, of India, and uh, also because the language, uh, I mean, the written language is, uh, I cannot read it, so I, I, I don't know exactly uh, about the, the content of the news, but what we see as well is that um, the different countries in the world have had their waves at different times, mm -hmm. and so uh, now uh, uh, India and Brazil are really struggling with the outbreak, while in Europe, for instance, is decreasing, and so, uh, so the conversation uh, in Europe, for instance, are really different now because they feel that they are out of the wood and, and now they look at the others who are entering uh, uh, these. And, and, um, and so I think this is um, what is important with this pandemic is it's a truly global event. And uh, uh, the infodemic is also tru truly global. And, and you cannot uh, think that um, you can communicate about it only in your country because immediately uh, the other uh, uh, countries in the world will look at what you say, how you say it, and, and it will have an impact on them and, and, uh, and vice versa. I mean, what others say uh, will have an impact on, on, um, on, on the response that is give in, done in a given country. So uh, this interconnectedness uh, is also a very important element that we need to take into account. Uh, you are not communicating anymore with your peers and, and your, your own community. You communicate with the world uh, every time you say something. So. Yep. I think the, the best example of this uh, uh, is the um, gap, suggested gap between vaccine doses, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Which research 
tells us one particular uh, gap, and I will not mention it because I'm not an expert, so I should not be naming a gap, but then public health messaging in, in the UK, um, uh, based on, the, on, on AstraZeneca's recommendations, in combination with the public health messaging for England, mm -hmm. and then you have other countries where, where they use the vaccine, but they are suggesting other gaps between the doses. And so then there's this conflict. Okay, so what should I, what should I rely on? Mm -hmm. is you know so so discerning the the research message from the from the clinical research message from the public health message mm -hmm. to one that is actually dependent on the availability of supplies etc so you know it, it puts a lot of burden of decision on the person on the ground and i think that's that that's that's what i think people are finding the hardest to deal with and as mm -hmm. uh, and you're absolutely right to point out that the messaging is no longer local because not only because it's a truly global event, but because it, people are watching each other. So if, mm -hmm. uh, because vaccines are the same, right? Like uh, being used globally. And therefore, if it's if it's a recommended period in the UK, why does that recommended period differ in another country? Yeah. And that's the question you legitimately ask and you feel worried. So, mm -hmm. so I think that's that's some so, so it resonates with what you what you what you said. Um, so I have a question for you from Ruchika who would like to know how can social media companies incorporate infodemic management strategies into their algorithms? I think that's a very, very good question. Mm -hmm. um, are you working with uh, social media companies? What has been your uh, strategy uh, on that front? Yes, we have been working with social media companies since the beginning of the pandemic to ask them to help us to put uh, verified information higher up uh, when, when people look for information so that our uh, uh, verified information comes first and not uh, public publicity or, or advertisement first. Um, and so they have been quite um, nice with us because they have uh, allowed us to uh, first post information but also helped us with some algorithms so that it comes first. Um, mm -hmm. They have also been uh, nice with us because we have been able to access uh, the uh, social media information freely. Uh, to develop those tools that uh, Avishal has, uh, has uh, showed. Uh, um, and so we hope that in the future, they will continue to help us to um, have access to those things because it's it, otherwise it could be quite expensive and, and we don't have, unfortunately, uh, those capacities. Um, and now this is why I'm really looking at uh, uh, infodemiology uh, and, and what the research will tell us because we we start to have um, a better understanding on how rumors start and how they spread. And, and, and then we can, uh, in the future, if we understand better phenomena, we can probably, um, um, uh, how can I say, modify algorithm in a way that uh, it, it's not um, uh, giving too much space for misinformation to spread. Uh, without, of course, um, um, reducing freedom of expression uh, because the risk is that uh, when there is information that uh, is not um, accurate uh, you you block twitter accounts and and uh, or any accounts and it might not be the best uh, intervention uh, mm -hmm. and so that's why the science will help us to understand uh, what what is the impact of each intervention and what is the best intervention we can have on 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 social uh, social media and then engage with social media platform to see if they can modify algorithm or, or help to um, make sure that uh, the virtual space is a safe space as well. Mm -hmm. That's that's good to hear that there is cooperation. After all, uh, we're in this you know together and have have to have a collect collective response and collective management. Uh, Anvisha has a similar question but addressed to a different agency uh, and would like to know if. You know, the WHO in a way communicates guidelines to various states or to the governments for mm -hmm. management of the spread of uh, misinformation. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we do have um, um, uh, issued, I mean, after the first global conference we had uh, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, we have issued a, a guidance on, on the 50 action that can be uh, taken. And so uh, uh, the, the governments can look at this and um, uh, we have also, uh, as I said, we try to uh, build this knowledge uh, with people. So uh, we also work with uh, certain governments who have uh, experienced different approach, different techniques, and we try to share those experience with other governments. So 
uh, it's a two two um, stream of of, of interventions here. Yeah. So, um, there's someone who hasn't given their name, but what they are asking is, what is the parameter used to calculate which topic is discussed more? Since these are broad topics, uh, they assume that it's not just by counting the repetition of words. So, is there? So, what is the way of understanding what is being discussed more? Yes, yeah, so uh, so we listen to uh, you know the the traffic on the web is enormous. So there is uh, of course a speech um, um, content analysis analysis that is uh, and uh, that is uh, performed on on the different tweets or Facebook um, uh, announcement. But what we do is that's why we have defined categories uh, so that we can um, and we have keywords and based on those keywords we can uh, assign. Uh, topics by category. So this is how we can uh, better calculate uh, what is uh, uh, the percentage of discussion around this topic and then um, uh, see if it's increasing or decreasing depending on the week. So we have our framework for analysis that is applied to this, uh, to, to the, the, the conversation on, online. And um, so the details I cannot tell you because uh, there are lots of algorithms behind mm -hmm. this, but uh, uh, we um, we have been using this since the beginning of, of the, um, the pandemic and, and we uh, cross-check uh, with uh, uh, different um, um, partners who are doing the same. So just to see if, if we use different framework, do we end up with the same type of results? So uh, just to, to, to uh, calibrate and, 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 um, and um, improve also our tools. Yeah. Uh, Supriya Dash has a has a question that speaks directly to your answer right now, which is about tools and how do you you know how do you manage what's been discussed or how do you understand what's being discussed. What she asks is, what do you do when the media or agencies in, uh, responsible for information are actively hiding or neglecting information such that it doesn't come into discussion? So how, how how do you have a strategy for that or do you have an approach for understanding? How do you deal with absence of a discussion? Uh, yeah, well, I think the problem is more that there is too much information than not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's uh, our role is more to uh, prioritize the information. For instance, when we, that's why the listening is so important because sometimes people discuss about things you feel, okay, why? Why are they talking about it? I mean, it's mm. not very interesting, not very important uh, from, your opinion but but in reality it matters for people and so even if it's something that doesn't matter it doesn't matter for a uh, normal media or uh, a journalist uh, for us it matters because people mm -hmm. are talking about it it means that it's important for people and we try to provide the answer or, or information that relates to to this kind of um, of questioning so uh, mm -hmm. That's what I, I think the, the, the problem currently is more too much information than no information, really. Okay, <laughs> so uh, we have here Abara, who's from Nigeria, whose question is about something that we've seen historically actually happen in almost all um, uh, uh, pandemics and epidemics in, in history, you know, starting with the, with the old place, is that of rumors. Mm -hmm. so how do you approach rumors? How do you discern rumors? And what do you do about it? Yeah, so um, this is what we call misinformation, actually. But uh, rumors is, is, is something usually more elaborated. It's a narrative. Mm -hmm. It's a narrative. And so a narrative is, is composed of many different pieces. And, um, and we are uh, studying the dynamic of those narratives, how they start, how they grow, how they disappear sometimes, because some of them, uh, they don't. Uh, but usually it, it's really uh, um, uh, very culturally sensitive. Uh, rumors are embedded in a culture in, in a number of um, um, parameters that are really specific to a, a context and a culture. And, mm -hmm. and this is where they can, it's like a seed. And, and when they find the right environment, they can grow and expand and so on. So uh, that's why the analysis of rumors is, is um, it's complex. It's, 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 it requires a lot of time. And, but our current uh, approach is really to, uh, through those um, um, tools, to detect them as early as possible before they amplify too much and before they, the narrative is completely um, uh, solidified. 
Yeah. Because when the narrative is solidified, it's very hard to uh, count counter it. Uh, but when it's only uh, uh, small, uh, small, I would say, small rumors uh, mm. that are uh, floating around, but they are not consolidated in one big narrative, it's easier to, to control each rumor. So in a mm. nutshell, this is how we try to address this issue. I'm sorry, I don't know if it's very clear, but... Uh, no, I think, I, I, I mean, it is hard, right? It is hard. And, uh, but, uh, you intervene and, and sometimes you hit and sometimes you, you don't, you know, and, and, and this is a phenomenon we've seen historically, you know, in all epidemics and pandemics, including in even before the 20th century. So um, there is, um, uh, Amartya asks a question that, you know, uh, for online media, we in many ways get the approach that uh, uh, the WHO has taken. How do these principles apply or are there different principles when dealing with traditional media like television, newspapers, radio, etc.? Mm -hmm. No, so we we uh, we work also with TVs, we uh, with the UNESCO, that's why our partners are so important because, uh, you know, WHO, we are a, a, an agency specialized in health, but we are not uh, specialized in media. So <laughs> we work with uh, UNESCO, for instance, and, and they have a, a, a global network of radio station. And so we work with them to um, uh, see how we can also um, uh, manage the infodemic on radio as well. So uh, we have partnerships for this uh, more traditional media, let's say. Okay. Okay, so there's Amit Goyal, who's an app maker, who would very much like to know what engineers and app designers like himself can actually do to help build clearer resources. I'm guessing I'm going to ask him to get in touch with you and Avichal to see if you know there are there is something that can be done there. Um, there is one question from Rajat who says. Is the news from the WHO website the best place to get verified information about the pandemic? So we, uh, again, as you mentioned earlier on, I mean, uh, it was a new disease one year ago and, and science is evolving. So, uh, and, and um, so there are publication, scientific publication um, uh, are really overwhelming. There is an infodemic also in science. So what we have done is also partnership with different um, uh, entities that are um, uh, doing literature review uh, for us, and so, and uh, we we ask specific questions, and they uh, search the literature, and and they do uh, this uh, uh, assessment of uh, what what do we know at this point in time on this particular subject. Mm -hmm. So, and this is why we have living guidance as well. We update our guidance as as we know things. So. Um, uh, but it's complex, and I understand that sometimes people may think that. Uh, we don't have the, the most accurate information. It's sometimes it's due to the fact that uh, we um, are late because it takes a lot of time also to review all this information. So we are in the process of uh, issuing a new guidance. It's not yet there. So what they see is the previous guidance. Also because we really try to um, be nuanced and being nuanced is not easy. Uh, it's much more easy to jump to conclusion and to have um, a very bold statements, rather than trying to uh, explain that uh, it's not black and white, uh, it's black in certain circumstances and white in other circumstances. And we really try to, to provide this nuance because um, um, this work of searching the science and, and really make sense of the science is, is, is very long and many of our member states don't have the capacity to do it. So we do it, we do it well, it takes time, uh, hmm. But at least uh, the information we have is really verified information. Okay. So uh, I have Abiyodun from, again, from Nigeria, whose question is, uh, and I guess it concerns ears and probably things that fall, uh, you know, kind of develop out of ears, uh, where uh, what they're asking is, would WHO develop a global tool for collating misinformation? And is there a plan to support countries to respond in their context? Yeah. So uh, here was a, a tool that we developed initially uh, in English, uh, but now we are translating it uh, uh, for other languages. So very soon we will have uh, uh, at least the six UN languages and we hope to have more. So really the objective of years is not for us, it's for governments, it's for uh, public health authorities at country level. Uh, and we are conducting currently a pilot 
with 20 different countries uh, to see if it works, if it's if it's the right uh, categories that we are using, if it's and how they can translate this information into decision. Uh, <laughs> because sometimes you have loads of information doesn't mean that you make good decision with it. So we are also working on the on this translation from information to action, and and see how we can um, uh, adapt the tools and the recommendation uh, in different contexts. And I will ask you the last question. Uh, it, there might be a very easy answer to it, or maybe not. Where Hazel Wallace from, uh, I'm assuming Australia, because she would like to know, is are there any plan to, plans to include Australia into the US platform? Uh, so I, I need to check with my colleagues. They know the name of the 20 countries. But if Australia is willing, I mean, we, uh, for us, I mean, uh, the more country we have, the better, because then we have really a, a good, um, uh, understanding of, of how it works in different contexts. So happy to include more countries. Okay, so I, I trust Hazel satisfied with that answer uh, in the event that Australia is actually not already on the list. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you, Sylvie, for taking the time to be with us this evening, um, afternoon for you. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry for those whose questions couldn't be answered, but this was an incredibly informative session. It also helps us understand how what what is the depth of work that goes into every field that is required to work in tandem with the medical aspect of a disease that goes global and why everything is important uh, because it concerns every pretty much every aspect of our lives i mean everything is affected right now we are in a lockdown right now in bangalore can't go out mm -hmm. so um, and there are others who don't have that privilege of not going out they you know they have suffered or their loved ones are in hospitals or they have lost people and as you um, you know very thoughtfully started the presentation um, with you know that this this is a difficult time and there is no stepping back but work has to go on and we see our effort in this exhibition season as a part of that larger effort to bring research to bring in-depth research to bring knowledge to bring various tools into the public view to generate better public debate on the phenomenon of contagion. So thank you very much, Sylvia, again. Thank you very much to the audience for taking the time to be with us this evening again. This was the third lecture since the exhibition season launched. Uh, next weekend, we will have another set of three lectures. Please do fill out the feedback form. We are going to have a workshop which is called Information, It's Complicated by Muhammad Radwan from Tactical Tech Collective on the 16th of May. We also have a video on our COVID series, which is videos of three minutes talking about three most important questions in an area, which has in fact been delivered by a colleague of Sylvie's, Tim Nguyen, who has produced a video called Managing Infodemics. Do please check our website for the video. It's a, it's a high impact short video on what are the, you know, uh, sort of taking, Sylvie gave us a very in-depth view today. And if you listen to Tim after this, I think you'll find that what Sylvie has shared with us today will help you make more sense of Tim's video. Tim is, with, Tim is the head of high impact events at the World Health Organization. So please do fill the feedback form. It will help us know if we are doing what we should be doing. Please register for our future programs and do visit the exhibition website, which is nowtransmitting.com. Thank you again, Sylvie and wish you a wonderful rest of the day. And thank you again to the audience. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.